everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. It's been a while since I've tackled a character examination. In today's video, we're going to give the people what they want. Well, maybe not, as Elida Doavrini Arroyhan typically registers at the top of the people's most hated characters in the Wheel of Time. Well, that actually might be a good video by itself now that I think about it. But a uh, big thank you over to Audible.com for supporting the channel. If you haven't checked out Audible or specifically the Wheel of Time audiobooks, what are you waiting for? You can get one for free just by heading over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus and signing up for the free trial there. You can keep the book regardless of whether you keep the service or not, and you really help the channel by doing so. So let's throw up a spoiler warning for the video. This video has a spoiler rating of red with spoilers all the way through Towers of Midnight. So if you haven't finished Towers of Midnight, please watch at your own risk. So as with all of my character examinations, we're going to break this down into 10 sections. History before the story, actions during the story, appearance, personality, special abilities, notable possessions, relationships, greatest moments, what happens after the story, and then overall impact on the story. And then lastly, I'll give my impressions on Elida as a character and let you know whether I think she was executed well within the story. So let's dive into my character examination of Elida Doavrini Arroyhan, history before the story. Elida was born in Mirndi in 950 of the New Age as the youngest daughter to a minor lord in the north part of the country. She was raised in Mirndi until she was 17 and started showing signs of the ability to channel. She left for the White Tower in 967 of the New Age and was the first novice in the history of the White Tower to be raised to accept it in only three years. During this time, Elida was pillow friends with Medani, another novice, and breaks off this relationship when she is raised to accept it because she believed it inappropriate to associate with a novice or basically anybody below her, which she kind of thinks everybody's below her. While still accepted, Elida has a foretelling that the royal line of Andor would be key to the last battle something that would influence her greatly in the future. As an accepted, Elida taught novices and, and was especially hard on those she believed had great promise. She was very hard on Moraine and Swan as they were equal to her in power level, something that was very rare. She would make life very difficult for them, holding them to very high standards in their first year as novices. After three years as accepted, she was raised to the shawl as an Aes Sedai in 973 of the New Age, which was the second year that Swan Sanche and Moraine Damadred were novices. In being raised to the shawl, Elida chose the Red Aja and left the White Tower to attach herself to the royal line of Andor due to her foretelling. She was able to align herself with Morghese Tracand, who was new to the throne at the time. After serving as the advisor to Queen Morghese for three years, Elida returns to the White Tower briefly, running into Moraine and Swan again as they're working on the census for the Amarlin. Elida resumes training the two of them very hard as they're very near to their test for the Shawl itself. She beats them mercilessly while training them, but this is actually a help to them because their test is actually going to involve something like that. And Elida is later actually chastised by Marine for beating them, for actually helping them for the test. Elida represents the Red Aja at Moraine's test for the shawl and adds a very cruel element to Moraine's test and is present for Swan's raising as well. Elida then returns to Andor and serves as Queen Morghese's advisor for about 20 odd years until the beginning of the story. Actions during the story. We first run into Elida after Rand falls into the palace garden in Andor in Eye of the World. Rand is brought before Queen Morghese and Elida, who was advising Morghese at the time, and she looks over Rand and has a foretelling that Rand would be at the center of all the pain and division that would come to the land. She advises Morghese to imprison Rand, but Morghese lets him go because he has committed no crime, but Elida becomes obsessed with Rand and what he might mean for the world. She attempts to find Rand in the city, but Moraine finds Rand and leaves with him before Elida can find them. Elida then accompanies Elaine and Gawain to Tarvalon as they go there to train and begins to research why Moraine would be helping such a dangerous Taviran. She interrogates men repeatedly about Rand, as she knows that Moraine had sent for men. She is eventually raised to sitter for the Red Aja at a very young age with the support of Galena Kazban, who was head of the Black Aja and the Red. But this was one of their plots in manipulating the White Tower. Piece by piece, Elida starts to figure out that Swan and Moraine had been working together to protect Rand. When Swan gets word that Rand had taken the Stone of Tear and Kalindor, 
Elida votes with the Hall to declare support for the Dragon Reborn. But not long after this, however, Elida leads a coup that has Swan removed as Amarlin and she is raised in her place. She chooses Alviarin as her Keeper of Chronicles and sets about trying to find and control Rand, as well as assert her authority on what's left of the White Tower. Her raising to the Amarlin seat caused half of the White Tower to split, with Aes Sedai rebelling and relocating to Saladar. Around this time, she meets with Padon Fane, who's trying to get the Shadar Logoth dagger from the storehouse in the White Tower. He advises her on how to control Rand, but it can be speculated that his influence at this point causes Elida to become increasingly irrational through the rest of the novel. Although this is just a theory, she does sort of deteriorate into intelligence, basically, from here, after demonstrating herself to be really formidable up to this point. She makes a number of bumbling moves that go wrong over and over. First, she sends an embassy to try to find and flatter Rand, but then secretly tells them to capture him if they can and bring him to the White Tower, which they do, and of course that results in Dumai's Wells. She also sends Gawain and the younglings with them and instructs Galena to make sure that they die somehow, which is kind of nefarious. She hears of Rand's amnesty for male channelers, and she sends a contingent of sisters to try and gentle and hang the entire Black Tower, refusing to listen to reports that their numbers are huge and essentially sends those sisters into captivity. She starts the preliminary building of a new palace for the Amarlin on the site of the warder's training grounds. Her narcissism uh, basically has no bounds. After her failure, she's blackmailed by Alviarin, who is also Black Aja, and then and basically she's blackmailed into further dividing the White Tower and giving orders that turn sisters against each other. Elida, seeking a way out of Alviarin's blackmail, sends Cien, a sitter from the White Aja, to investigate treasonous activities that Alviarin might be involved in. Cian misinterprets her intentions and believes that Elida is asking him to hunt the Black Aja, which begins the Black Aja hunt within the White Tower. Elida eventually reasserts her control over Alviarin after the information that Alviarin was trying to blackmail her with came to light and other sisters ended up taking the blame. Egwene, the rebel Amarlin seed, is captured and Elida has her reduced to a novice. But Egwene resists and undermines Elida's rule from within ultimately confronting her and being beaten by Elida at a dinner with a couple sitters. This event greatly reduces Elida's influence and almost has her removed as Amarlin. She does, however, remain the Amarlin, but the Shan Chan surprise attack the White Tower, and Elida is taken as a Damani and eventually renamed Sufa, and forced to demonstrate traveling to Tuon, giving the Shan Chan the ability to travel. Appearance Elida is described as being handsome rather than pretty. Her looks are described as severe, which I kind of interpret as having a very serious case of RBF. She also has very dark eyes, and she has the ageless face that is typical to all Aes Sedai that have worn the shawl for any amount of time and have sworn on the oath rod. Personality. Elida is like many Red Aja sisters in that she is very stern and serious much of the time, but Elida has a great sense of self-importance about her. She has a very off-putting presence with everyone that she meets, as they kind of feel that she's cold and harsh towards them, and they would be right, and she really lacks any kind of positive emotions. She's very manipulative. She appears to be selfish, narcissistic, and very vindictive. All that being said, she is extremely intelligent up until a certain part in the series, and she has a very strict sense of her own morality. For instance, she pushes Moraine and Swan very hard when they are novices, even beating them, because she believed that that brought out the best in them. She genuinely believed that she was helping them become the best they could be. She becomes more and more erratic and unbalanced as the series goes on, again, possibly due to the influence of Padon Fane and his corrupting abilities. Special Abilities Elida, at the very beginning of the series at least, was one of the most powerful female channelers alive, with only Cadswain, Kareen Nagashi, and Mylan Arganya being stronger than her, and Moraine, Swan, Lelaine, and Ramonda all being her equals in strength in the One Power. This gave her very high standing among Aes Sedai. In addition to her raw strength, she was very dutiful in her practice with weaves and was very skilled, being able to pick up new weaves very quickly. She is notable for having the rare talent of foretelling, which is basically being able to read the pattern and see the future to an extent. Notable Possessions There are really no notable possessions of Elidas throughout the novel that have any real plot significance, and she really doesn't gain any throughout the series that she uses on any regular basis. Relationships Elida is not really known for any meaningful relationships, as she isn't the type to associate with those that she views as lower than her, which is basically everybody. This goes to a greater extent when she's the Amarlin, and this is kind of part of her internal morality. She had a pillow friend relationship with Medani when they were novices, and she resumes that later when she's the Amarlin for a very short time, 
but as a means to an end. She conspires with Alviarin to overthrow Swan, but they have a very combative relationship, as Alviarin, being Black Aja, is actually blackmailing Elida. She did have a good relationship with Galena Kazban, the head of the Red Aja, but also of the Black, despite Elida not being Black Aja herself. She was basically used. Greatest moments. So this is tough because she's such a hateable character, but from the perspective of the greatest moment for her, it would be when she uncovers Swan's plot and successfully overthrows her and becomes Amarlin. Her greatest moment from our perspective as the reader, or at least my opinion of it, is when Egwene stood up to her during the dinner in a gathering storm and caused Elida to essentially lose her freaking mind. I loved it. What happens after the story? Well, Elida doesn't really have a happy ending. She spends much of her remaining life as a Damani serving Tuon. It's possible that she could escape, but she would be completely disgraced as an Aes Sedai at this point and broken as a person. Egwene really did pity her for a good reason in saying that she did not deserve her fate of a lifetime of slavery for what she did. Overall impact on the story. Elida serves an important role in the story, not so much as a villain, but rather a character that we love to hate that drives certain plot elements. She isn't evil in the sense that the shadow is, be is evil, She's just a very flawed person put in a position of power that she really wasn't qualified for from a leadership standpoint. She's important to the plot and has some interesting subtlety to her character as well. But do I think she was executed well? I do think she was done well. She is certainly one of the most hated characters within the series, and to be able to generate that kind of emotion, she has to be written well. The one thing I wish that was different about her was that I wish it was more clear that Pat on Fane had an effect on her because she showed herself to be so intelligent and so capable for the first part of the novels. And then when she becomes Amerlin, meets him, and then she just basically becomes stupid overnight and unable to actually see what's going on in the world. I'm fairly certain this is because of Pat Fane's influence, but I would have loved for that to be more explicit because it just feels like her character changed. So that's my character analysis of Elida Doavrini Arroyham. What do you think? What did you think of Elida as a character? Is there anything about her that I missed? Please let me know in the comments below and make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release new content. We should be getting some Wheel of Time TV show news this week, so I'll make sure to get some videos addressing whatever that is out when it comes out. Please also check out the Patreon if you want to support what I'm doing here on the channel and check out some of my Patreon only content like early video releases, the maps used in my videos that I'm creating from scratch, as well as scripts and other patron-only stuff. I very much appreciate everyone that's over there supporting me. The link is in the description below. Guys, thanks for watching, and until next time, peace out. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do. Mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy us a free crying. Tinker, oh dear, Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me?